Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to another installment of Spec Soda Prep's webinar series. The webinar we have lined up for everyone today is the sample preparation of imported plastic toys for the analysis of BPA and phthalates. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Matt Snyder, Marketing Associate for Spec Soda Prep, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. First off, everyone in attendance today will be receiving emails with the copy of the presentation slides as well as a link to the webinar recording on our YouTube account. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, simply type them into the question box on your screen. And we'll get to as many as we can during our Q&A session. So with those items out of the way, I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Pat Atkins is Product Application Specialist for Spec Soda Prep and our uh, webinar veteran on staff from a number of previous webinars, including trace metals in lipstick, the chemistry of wine, gourmet foods, and so on. So without any further ado, uh, Pat, the mic's all yours. Thank you, Matt. And I would like to welcome everybody to the first of our two parts of the study of imported children's toys for phthalates and BPA. I'd like to just kind of go over um, what part one and part two is going to consist of so you have an idea of, of what we're going to be showing you today. Part one is the sample preparation. And we were coming from a point of being a standards reference company and not really knowing a lot about the plastic business or the uh, sampling of plastic toys for, for analysis. So we did speak to quite a few of our customers and found out how they were doing their analyses. And uh, we basically started to learn from scratch about what was needed for the, the analysis of toys. So I wanted to pass on a little bit of what I've learned about uh, of the background of plastics. And if you already are well-versed in the, the study of plastics, I apologize for some of the repetitive information, but maybe you'll find one or two points uh, new and interesting. Then we're going to go on a little bit to the how we did the plastics identification and other methods that you can identify some of your unknown plastic toys with. Then we're going to go through the sample preparation techniques to prepare the, the toy sample from the first step through the grinding and up into the, the extraction and testing cycle. Then we're going to look a little bit at the most common method that we have found for uh, testing uh, PVC toys, the Consumer Product Safety Commission method. And then we'll do a small snapshot of our findings. We'll definitely go into more detail in part two, which we're offering on June 7th in two sessions in the morning and the afternoon. So please feel free to join us for that follow-up part two session. Uh, next week, there should be an email with registration information if you're interested in that webinar. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, methods, including the CPSC method, some of the extraction method development we've done here at SPECS. Uh, including work we've uh, done with CEM on some methods, microwave method optimization. And we're going to compare it to some of the methods out there and follow up by the GCMS analysis and finally our detailed findings. So you'll get all of the, the, the findings we found in our toys at that time. So one of the questions whenever we look at a research project here at Specs is what's in the news and why should we do it? If you've looked at the news for the past six years, BPA and phthalates has created quite a stir in the headlines. There's a lot of, of talk and legislation going around to control BPA, the uh, regulation of different phthalates and children's pots, products and sports bottles. So there, there's been a lot of talk about these health problems that are being linked to BPA. But as a brand new parent, my most important reason to study phthalates was my nine-month-old daughter. Uh, I would like to know what I'm giving her when I'm giving her Mr. Rubber Duck. To begin with, phthalates have been around for almost 100 years now. They've been produced since the late 1800s, and they've been in commercial use since the 1920s. So as I said, about 100 years of, of commercial use for these phthalates. And in plastics, they can be anywhere of 10 to 60 percent by weight of these particular phthalates. They're used as binders, coatings fragrances and, and different pigments. And the problem with having so much of these particular compounds is that there's a variety of health disorders that are associated with exposure to phthalates, including things like asthma and reproductive disorders. Um, more importantly, it's been known that phthalates are endocrine dis disruptors. They mimic different endocrine compounds, and they disrupt these reproductive and endocrine cycles. 
Now, the response to all of the, the controversy and scientific research uh, regarding these health effects is that as of 2009, the U.S. has restricted uh, certain phthalates in children's toys. Uh, Mexico, the EU, and Japan have also restricted or banned the use of certain phthalates in children's toys and child care articles. Here is a, a list of a large group of phthalates that are common in different types of plastic for different applications. The six that are under restriction or ban are these uh, particular six phthalates, so starting with the dianbutyl phthalate and going through to the uh, diisononyl phthalate. If we're looking at the, the bans and what the bans actually consist of, in the U.S., uh, the band is by the Consumer uh, Protection, and it's the Consumer Product Safety Commission method that is used uh, to measure the phthalates. For each of the six phthalates, there is a band of 0.1% for each individual phthalate. That means that DHP cannot exceed 0.1% of the total weight of the toy. The EU and Japan are a little bit more strict on their phthalate ban. Uh, it's 0.1% combined of the six phthalates that it cannot exceed in order for it to, for that particular toy to, to pass. Also, there are some uh, different designations for some of the phthalates. For the larger phthalates, the DINP, the DIDP, and the DNOP, those bands are actually on the uh, toys or child care articles with oral contact, meaning those were designed to be put in the mouth or there is uh, mouth contact with the child. For bisphenol A, again, it's also been around for over 100 years. And uh, in, the, in the world, there's 3.7 million metric tons produced a year. Most of us uh, come in contact with bisphenol A on a daily basis through contact with polycarbonate sports bottles that are not bisphenol A free, uh, coating and resins, epoxies. Uh, most commonly, we usually on a daily basis come in contact with canned foods and many uh, canning epoxies that are in uh, the coating of the interior of the cans have this bisphenol A resin inside or epoxy inside to protect the food from the interior metal of the can. Again, the health effects are, are basically they're endocrine disruptors just like the phthalates were. And uh, what the point of, of interest is that scientists have known since the 1930s that there were estrogenic effects from the exposure of bisphenol A. There was a study in the 1930s where rats were exposed to bisphenol A and these estrogenic, excuse me, estrogenic effects were observed. The EPA has a drinking water guideline of 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day for bisphenol A. But there have been recent studies over the past few years that show very, very low amounts can produce these estrogenic effects and as low as 0.025 micrograms per kilogram per day has been suggested as being uh, possibly a dangerous level. This NLA is a little more cloudy when it comes to the, uh, the ban and re uh, regulations concerning this NLA. For the U.S., there are different bans for this NLA or restrictions for various child care products and sports bottles and other uh, materials that have oral contact. But there's no national ban. Some of these bans are state by state or county by county, depending on uh, where the ban exists. In the EU, they have banned polycarbonate baby bottles containing bisphenol A, as well as in Canada, uh, polycarbonate baby bottles have been banned. Canada also, within the last year, has uh, deemed that BPA is toxic, and so this has become an action item for, for more legislation and re research. Here in the U.S., most of us refer to the consumer product uh, safety testing method, the standard operating procedure for the determination of phthalates, children's toys, and child care articles. And uh, the, the last version uh, that I've seen is uh, 0.03. It measures the strict, uh, sorry, the six restricted phthalates, and it outlines a course of sample preparation, extraction, and analysis. For our study, we had 26 toys that we were purchasing from different dollar and discount stores. And we had some items that had definite oral contact. We had whistles, snorkels, baby cups, some funny teeth. We also had items that if any parent has a child under three, you know that there's possible or probable oral contact with, such as army men, rubber ducks, and like fashion dolls. 
the first step of our sample preparation was to subdivide these toys. We had 26 toys, and they were subdivided into 65 different types of samples. For something like this truck, we did remove the stickers that are on this truck, but we did not remove the, the painting that was on these wheels. So there's some silver paint on the wheels, and that was not removed. That was just ground into a, a homogeneous powder. If you're doing metals testing as a follow-up, or if you're just doing metals testing and you're, and you're not doing phthalates uh, at all in your plastics, there are many, many methods that actually describe you having to scrape or remove the paint from, from the toy in order to test it. The next step for us was to prepare the sample for extraction, which meant either cutting or grinding the sample. The consumer product safety method says less than two millimeters for your sample, or to grind it using a cryogenic method, uh, such as our freezer mill, to make it a fine powder. Um, here at Spex CertiPrep, uh, we are sister company with Spex Sample Prep, so we had the ability to use their 6970 freezer mill in order to, to grind our sample. So we also did use polycarbonate vials, and there was some concern whether the polycarbonate vials would add additional contamination. We ran blank QC polycarbonate material uh, and blank QC polyethylene and other materials through the vials, and we found that there was uh, no real measurable amount of phthalate or BPA contamination. So the first step in our grinding process was to take about two and a half grams of our plastic toy and we cut it into chunks, uh, about five millimeters or less. And then we were able to run several vials at a time, so we had a fairly high throughput of our toys. Our program was we used a pre-cool cycle. This made the samples uh, very brittle. So then we were able to grind them for five cycles at two minutes a cycle. And in between each cycle, again, we did some additional cooling, so we were able to basically shatter the, the plastic and make it a nice, nice fine powder. Uh, for those who do use your the uh, cryogenic freezing mill, the impact rate was about 16 impacts per second, and that I've been told was actually a, a cycle of eight. Uh, so if the impactor goes back and forth, uh, so it's eight times creating 16 movements of the impactor. And for difficult plastics, uh, it suggested that we add more cooling time to them to make them a little bit more brittle and to keep them below the melting point. So the cryogenic grinding allowed us to get this nice fine analytical powder. We had our friend Mr. Rubber Duck here reduced to a fine powder as well as some of the other uh, oral contact toys here. We also wanted to see if this particle size would help increase our extraction. So Going on the theory that the decreased particle size increased our surface area in our sample, we looked at the different sizes of material from what the Consumer Product Safety Commission suggests, which is under two millimeter, or ground sample. So we took PVC material, again, our friend uh, Mr. Duck, there's a joke, we were starting to call this the story of, of Mr. Duck, because Mr. Duck becomes the, the hero and the villain of the story throughout our, our testing. Uh, so Mr. Duck here, which is made of PVC, was cut up into different sizes, uh, a greater than five millimeter piece, a five millimeter piece, some random two to five millimeter pieces, a two millimeter chunk, and some ground samples, that fine powder on the bottom. And then we uh, extracted the samples uh, both by the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, PVC wet method and by uh, microwave extraction. What resulted was a, a range of different ec extracts. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see our five millimeter chunks and the resulting extract, which has um, a little bit of haziness to it, but not much color. And as you go to the finer powder all the way to the right, you do see a very dark colored extract coming off of, off of the powder. When we looked at the Consumer Product Safety Commission wet method, which is based on uh, THF dissolution and then precipitation with hexane, we took the two millimeter uh, particles suggested by the, the method, and we did take the fine analytical powder, and we dissolved both and then uh, attempted to precipitate the material out again. On the left, you have the two millimeter particles, and there is a, a slight yellow color, and it is a, a a little more cloudy than on the right-hand side where you have the, the powder and a little darker yellow color. 
So here are some grinding tips when you're going to use a cryogenic uh, freezer mill to grind your toy samples. If you're concerned about polycarbonate vials, which is a, a very common choice for grinding, you can possibly use a blank QC sample in order to eliminate any contamination concerns. For our use, we had different blank polymer QC samples, and we ran them through the entire grinding process, and we, we monitored what the contamination level was. The other option is you could use a stainless steel vial, but then you have to worry about possible metal contamination if you're following up with any type of metal analysis. So if you're doing toys for lead or some other compounds, uh, you might not want to choose the stainless steel vial. But again, you can always use a blank QC sample and run that through your grinding process in order to uh, simulate any potential contamination issues. More factors to consider when you're grinding is the particle size. If your particles are too large, if you cut them above that 5 millimeter, maybe 10 millimeter, 15, you can inhibit some of the movement. So it might take you longer to get that fine analytical powder. Also, if your particles are too small, it might limit impact. You might have it bouncing around and not getting the, the full benefit of the impactor. Shape is also very important when you're doing your grinding. Something like the fibrous material of Barbie's hair, this polypropylene material, was very difficult to grind. It had to be put into a smaller vessel, and it actually needed more cooling time to make it brittle enough to, to grind to a fine powder. Another challenging sample are round spherical beads, and something like this would be inside like a stuffed animal, uh, they tend to bounce around a little bit. And again, you need to be able to limit the amount of bouncing that they do, and you're going to need additional cooling in order to get them to shap. A few other factors which will affect your, your polymer grinding is the type of polymer. You have some high melt polymers and some low melt polymers. You really do need to know what the melting point of your polymers are to, to understand how much cooling time and how much additional cooling you're going to need in order to effectively grind those samples. So if you're uh, going to grind something like PVC with some additives to it, uh, PVC can have a melting point of anywhere from 100 to 260 degrees, depending on whatever additives are involved. So this, when it, it is ground, uh, it's going to grind very well. It, it takes a, a while for this particular plastic to possibly heat up. But something like an ABS plastic or a, a polyethylene plastic might need additional cooling time in order to, to make a nice, fine, and a uniform analytical powder. Our spec sample prep division does have a flyer on the different uh, types of polymer and the different suggestions for grinding programs. Uh, they've given us a few examples here of polycarbonate, which is the material a lot of baby bottles have been made from. Things like polypropylene pellets, which would be the interior pellets for, for some toys or for some stuffed animals. Uh, some sheet of um, a PVC, which would be something like a vinyl siding. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which is most commonly known as a bottle cap type of material. And then, of course, you have our friend Mr. Rubber Duck, which is a, a PVC material. This flyer will be available if you request it from us by uh, emailing us or calling us and requesting the sample preparation flyer for the polymer. The next step for us, or it could be a pre-step to your grinding, is your plastics identification. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety uh, Commission method does have a section for pre-screening your plastics by IR. And you can use IR, FTIR for uh, the identification of the plastics. You can also use thermogravimetric analysis, uh, differential scanning calorimetry, uh, Raman spectroscopy. Or you can look and see if there's actually any identification marks on your plastic. A lot of plastic nowadays has a recycling mark on the bottom. And finally, if you don't have any of the above, you can go kind of old school and get the, the physical and chemical testing done on the bench top, and that will give you an idea of the groupings of the different plastics. The first step for us was obviously the easiest one. You take the, the toy, you turn it over, and, or you look at the packaging and see if there's any recycling information. Unfortunately, for our toys, there was no uh, recycling code on the packaging or on the toy itself, so that made our, our job a little bit more difficult. But uh, for those who are interested, this is the, the common codes, recycling codes for polymers, uh, going from code one, which is your polyethylene terephthalate, your soft drink bottles, all the way through uh, nine, which is ABS plastic, 
and most of us have some experience, at least in childhood, with ABS plastic because that's the composition of Legos. Now, if you're unable to identify your plastics by an instrumental method or by a, a identification code on the bottom, then you do have to kind of go old school and uh, look up the, the different polymer characteristics and devise a plan to identify your polymers based on the different chemical and physical characteristics. This has the most common possible plastics for, for toys, polypropylene, polyethylene, ABS, polystyrene, PVC, and polycarbonate. And this is a chart with the different densities and solubilities for the different plastics, including the melting point and any flame test results. For most of the plastics, they are uh, soluble in, in uh, one or more of these different solvents from hexane through THF. The only notable exception are the polyethylene products, the LDPE and the HDPE, which are pretty uh, insoluble to most solvents. What resulted for us from these benchtop tests was this very uh, involved flow chart that allowed us to tentatively identify all of our plastic toys and put them into extraction grouping. Now, the blue squares of this little flow chart are density tests. So we used different density tests to, to basically subdivide the plastic toys into different groups. And then we would perform solubility tests. We would try to take a piece of our toy and then dissolve it into different solvents and then from there go on to the next step. The green squares are tentative identification for us. The red circles were what we finally identified the plastics mm -hmm. as. And at the very bottom, there's a yellow tri triangle. Whenever we had a sample which we believed to be PVC, uh, we took that sample and we did a flame test using copper wire to see if that particular sample reacted as a halogen. Just a little closer look at the flow chart. We immediately divided our samples into the low density and the high density plastics using uh, water. And one of the things that you need to do when doing a density test is never assume that the standard you're using has uh, the correct density. Maybe you're the density of your uh, particular solvent or, or water might be slightly different. It shouldn't be too far off, but you should always double check your densities if you're going to use it as a standard. For us, we checked our, the first density against water, and we divided the plastics into some of the, uh, the lower density plastics, like the, uh, the polyethylenes, the polypropylenes, and the ABS, or into the higher density plastics, the polycarbonate, the, the PVC. You might notice the ABS plastics on both sides. Uh, that's because if you uh, remember from the chart before, the density of ABS plastic is 1.04. That's so close to the density of water that if the, the particle size uh, or the surface area of that particular particle uh, was too large, then it could possibly cause the piece to float. So just in case, we kind of uh, left the ABS on both sides until further down in the identification flow chart. Looking at the lower density uh, polymers, our next step was a solubility test with DCM. And we were then finally able to go through the different steps of density and solubility to break them down into HDPE, polypropylene, and ABS. We also then repeated the process for the heavier, uh, more dense plastics by using something like glycerol or uh, DCM to check the density and the solubility. And we were able to tentatively identify the polycarbonates, the polystyrene, the ABS, the PVC, and the polyethylene terephthalates. The final test, as I said before, was a flame test where if we believe the sample was PVC, we did ignite it using a copper wire to see if we had that characteristic green color from a halogen exposure. We were then able to take our 65 samples and tentatively identify them as follows in this chart. The majority of our samples were LDPE and PVC with 22 LDPE samples, uh, 17 PVC, PVC samples, 6 HDPE samples, seven polycarbonate samples, two polypropylene samples, one ABS sample, uh, one silicone or rubber, and that was primarily the, the nipple on the pacifier, and then one uh, cloth sample, which was the fashion doll clothing. We mostly focused on what we consider to be the cleanest and the dirtiest plastic for toys, the dirtiest plastic being, or potentially dirtiest plastic being the PVC, and the potentially cleanest plastic being the HDPE. 
For HDPE, our toys were the, the figures like the police and the military and the firemen action figures or the army men. And the parts of the, the toy car, most notably the Betlac base, which you can't see in this picture, but it's the base in which the colored car uh, sits on top of, the black wheels, and the silver interior parts like the seat. Our PVC toys, there were things like the snake figures, some dinosaur figures, two shark figures, and our three cartoon figures who we've uh, blurred the identity of to protect the innocent here. We also had some toys with oral contact or possible oral contact. Oral contact toys were designed to be put in the mouth, so you have things like snorkels and the party teeth, which were made out of PVC. You also have possible oral contact, because as I said before, if you have a child under three, you know more than likely any of these toys are going to be going in the mouth, including the rubber duck, the lion, and the fashion doll. So we decided it was very important for us before we started the extraction to do the identification because of the different solvent solubilities. We wanted to know uh, which solvents we should be using for which plastics. We wanted to be able to not dissolve the plastic, but definitely do an efficient extraction. There are also some methods that are very polymer specific. Uh, in particular, the Consumer Product Safety Commission method, the, the, the wet method that is written in, within the method itself is PVC polymer precipitation method. It is not necessarily designed to go with any other particular polymer. There's also the concern of what additives are you looking for. This is a, a talk about us looking for phthalates and BPA, but there are a lot of other additives in plastics. And it's possible that at some point your lab or uh, as a researcher you might be interested in those other additives. So you want to be able to, to go back and, and, and look at those samples and see if you can analyze them for these other potential additives or contaminants. So things like a polyethylene terephthalate, it's possible there's acetaldehyde and antimony in, in those particular samples. For something like a, a polyethylene, well, there is very little in the way of, of BPA or phthalates that are often added to these uh, polyethylene compounds. So that might change the way that or the amount of emphasis you put on polyethylene samples. Something like a polypropylene has the possibility of olamides or quaternary biocides. Uh, polystyrene has, of course, styrene in it, and it is a flammable material, so there is some risk of, of flammability with working with that material. Uh, polycarbonate is most notorious for its links to BPA or, or the creation of the polycarbonate using BPA. And then you have your ABS styrene, which has a combustion product of hydrogen cyanide, which is it's interesting to, to make sure you take note of if you're working with this material in your lab and you're planning on doing a flame test on it. I've left the, the worst for last, the polyvinyl chloride, because it is notable for its phthalate exposure, uh, BPA, and heavy metals. This is directly from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. If you're choosing a method for extraction, uh, most people that we have spoken to do use the THF dissolution and precipitation method, but there are a wide variety of choices that are allowed by the method. That includes stock fluid extraction, pressurized fluid extraction, microwave extraction, and ultrasonic extraction. So sometimes it's better to investigate some of these alternate methods uh, rather than trying to make one method fit all. Now, this is the Consumer Product Safety Commission's wet method. And as I said, it is very specific. It's precipitate any PVC polymer. So this is not really intended for any, any other materials. And it uses about 0.05 grams. Um, this is a, a pretty small amount. It's not an undoable amount. It is a small amount. And that's where some of your particle size might actually come into concern, depending on what the density of the material is. Uh, it might be difficult to get a representative sample at 0.05 grams uh, from the material unless it is ground into a homogeneous powder. Um, then you also have to just dissolve your uh, sample in your THF and then precipitate it out with 10 mils of hexane. What I've found, if you use your 0.05 grams and your 15 mils of solvent, sometimes your PVC toys don't always precipitate with the 15 mils of, of, of total material. Uh, right here, there's a picture of two of our PVC toy samples here. And our CRM that we've created for PVC is a PVC polymer with only the six restricted phthalates and BPA in it. It does not have any slip agents or any other additives in it. 
the other two uh, samples marked 4A and 12B are real toy samples, which do have other additives in it. And when you add your THF and you dissolve your material and then you try to precipitate with the hexane, you really don't get a full precipitation of the material. And I believe this was up to 30 mils of hexane in, in the here with still n not a full precipitation. Then you do sometimes have to increase your solvent, which dilutes your sample. And if you're looking at the limit that, that is being set, the 1,000 micrograms per gram or your 0.1 percent, and you injected this particular material straight, this uh, extraction at 15 mils straight, you'd lo be looking about 3 ppm on your mass spec. If you dil dilute this according to the method and you're at that 0.1 percent, you're looking about 0.7 ppm in your method. And then you'd want to use SIM in order to really get a, a good response. But if you do use SIM, there's a potential of missing other additives. Um, we were not specifically looking just for the six restricted phthalates. We wanted to see everything that was in our samples. So we did use scan mode. Uh, we were able to see a lot of things that uh, were not just the six uh, restricted phthalates. We were able to see things like BPA. We were able to see small amounts of other phthalates that are not restricted. We also wanted to know what the extraction efficiency of this particular method was. And did it apply to all the polymers, or was it just efficient for PVC? In speaking with some of our, our customers, we did find that, that there were some people that were using this method for all the different types of polymers, not just the, the, the PVC. So the first thing we did is we have a spec sort of prep CRM, a polyethylene matrix CRM. And we tried using this extraction, this uh, dissolution and precipitation method for our PVC CRM. And we found by using this, this method on polyethylene, we found that we recovered 50% of the phthalate material in our CRM. So when using a polyethylene matrix, uh, we found half of what was actually in the matrix. Now we decided, well, we're going to develop now a PVC CRM, in which we did. And we did run this using the same dissolution and precipitation method. And we did receive pretty good uh, recovery for it, between 83 and 94 percent recovery for the CRM. What we did also find, though, was we had some poor reproducibility with it. And we believe that was possibly due to GC contamination. What happened is we injected the sample multiple times uh, within a, a sample sequence. And over subsequent injections, we would see an increase of, of response. And the response was clearly getting larger with each additional injection. So when we looked at the RSD values for the, the five or six injections that we did, we found that for the, the, the phthalates listed here, our RSD values really were pretty high, from 35 to 60 percent. So what we decided to do was to use microwave extraction in order to take a look and see if it was comparable to the, the, the wet method and, and what the differences were. We had large amounts of solvent for the, the consumer product safety wet method, and we did see uh, less concentration. If we did the, the dilution outline in the method, we did miss some of the additives than if we ran it concentrated. Um, we did find that there was some interference of the PVC polymer with our operation of our GCMS. I was not very popular once I'd run my samples on our GCMS. It took a while for us to bake out the system and really clean out the background and get the, the system back to an acceptable response for the other scientists in the lab. And again, we found some uh, poor reproducibility. And quite frankly, it was a very time-consuming method for each sample to be uh, dissolved and then precipitated out again. So for our microwave method, we used about 10 to 15 mils of solvent, but we could use up to one gram of sample. So we could really have a high concentration to see all the small phthalates, to see the, the bisphenol A, to see some of the other additives that we might not have seen otherwise. And then when we found that that concentration was too high for some of our targets, like maybe DEHC, it did give us the freedom to, to basically back it down and, and dilute it down so we could see, the, see the, a more linear range for our larger phthalates. For the microwave method, since we were not dissolving the polymer, we saw very little in the way of interference or carryover. And we had great reproducibility. And we were able to run multiple samples at once, so our throughput was very high. And this is just a comparison of the two uh, methods, our optimized microwave method. For all of our phthalates, we have nothing above 3%. 
and for the, the wet method, when we ran our CRM, like I said before, we had between uh, 35 and 60 percent. Now we're going to give you a small sneak peek of the results that we found for our PVC uh, toys. You're going to get to see what's in Mr. Mr. Rubber Duck here. For our PVC toys, the biggest culprit in the PVC toys was the DEHP. And you can see across the board of our uh, PVC toys that uh, majority of our toys did contain a very large amount of DEHP. If you look at the, the limit prescribed, 1,000 micrograms per gram or 0.1% of the toy, you can see there's the, the line there of where the 0.1% should fall. And most of our samples uh, exceeded that limit. Um, we did have the funny teeth that did come below limit, and they are an oral exposure toy. But if you look at something like the snorkel mouthpiece, the snorkel mouthpiece came in at close to 15,000 micrograms per gram. And our friend, Mr. Duck, was, was very, very high at over uh, 25,000 micrograms per gram of DEHA. If we look at the total concentration of the six restrictive phthalates in each toy, for the EU and Japan, that total limit can only reach 1,000. For the US, that potentially could reach 0.1% uh, for each phthalate, could re reach 0.6%. Uh, in this case, again, we have quite a few toys that would not pass either the US or the Japanese limit. Uh, the snorkel tube did pass and the snorkel teeth, but the snorkel mouthpiece that's actually put in the mouth is still way above the, the limit for both uh, EU, Japan, and the US. And again, our friend the rubber duck is pretty high up there. When we look for uh, bisphenol A, we found bisphenol A prevalent in three toys. Um, Mr. Duck, again, is uh, the hero and the, the villain of our piece. He had about 800 micrograms per gram. Uh, the dinosaur was about 200 micrograms per gram. And the doll's head was over 1,000 micrograms per gram. And those two toys are quite possibly oral contact, even the dinosaur some child might be putting in their mouth. So in summary, when we were preparing the, the toys for testing, we first separated the toys into its component parts. We tried to isolate the different types of plastic and separate those types of plastic or those different colors. We did do separations by colors as well. We removed the stickers. And you can also remove the paint. And it's suggested if you plan on following up with metals testing for you to remove the paint. For us, there was very little paint material, so we decided to just uh, grind and try to make a homogeneous powder. When you do uh, break down your samples, either into the pieces or the powder, you just have to understand the powders will increase your surface area and, and increase the amount of extracted materials into, into your solvent. Um, the grinding will work best if you use a cryogenic condition. Uh, the room temperature grinding will not allow you to have as fine of a powder. And you can always use blank CRM materials like blank polyethylene or blank PVC to monitor any potential contamination issues with your grinding process. We found it, uh, at this point, helpful to identify our plastics for us to refine our extraction process. And there are many ways you can do that. The markings on it, um, IR, ramen, TGA, physical and chemical testing. But some of the concerns you should really think about when developing your methods or following any particular extraction method is one size does not fit all. The wet method is for PVC only, and it really does not work particularly well for some of the other polymers. For the polyethylene we tested, this method had 50% recovery. So you can always ex uh, check your extraction efficiency of your method by running a QC CRM. And as we said, we have the polyethylene, and, and we will be having soon a, a PVC CRM where you can run alongside your samples and, and check that your extraction efficiency is basically where you would like it to be. One of the problems we had with the, the wet extraction method or the dissolution and precipitation method is that our polymers of our toys, the real toy samples, did not fully precipitate. So it did cause problems with our GCMS, and it did raise our RSD. We also found there was a large amount of solvent and dilutions for us to make. And it lowered our ability to see some of the lower level phthalates or BPA. And when we had to employ SIM, it, it limited what phthalates we were able to see. And one of the points that's been brought up recently in uh, some AM, ASTM discussions about phthalates is that there's potential, there's a very large list of additives that are uh, made to, to work with plastics, slip agents, and other things, adhesives. 
and all of these potential additives could interfere with plastic analysis for your six targeted phthalates. And some of them might actually mimic or have very similar uh, GCMS profiles uh, or spectra and could be confused with a target phthalate. And if you're only monitoring for your targeted phthalate, there's a possibility you might misidentify or you might mistake one of these additional additives as one of the targeted phthalates. For our results, uh, we looked mostly at PVC, especially for, for today's study. Uh, the most prevalent in PVC was DEHP, and it had the very high concentrations in excess of the consumer product safety consumer limit. For two of our oral contact samples, we had between 10,000 and 30,000 micrograms per gram of DHP. That's between 10 and 30 times higher than what the, the official limit is. We also found BPA in three of our samples. For part two, we are going to go a little bit more into our extraction optimizations, uh, our analysis, and of course, very detailed results of the different types of plastics and, and the phthalates that we did find. If anyone is interested, this is a list of the uh, spec to prep standards that we use, including uh, the two new standards which we are hoping will be introduced at the end of this summer. So those who have been asking us for PVC uh, QC standards and PVC blank standards, those we believe will be available by the end of the summer. All right, Pat, thank you for uh, the presentation. I'll now open up the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, just Type them into the question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we already have a few in here already, so we'll get right to it. Okay, what is the origin of the tested toys? Uh, according to the packaging, the origin of all of the tested toys was from China. So um, I did try to find other toy um, areas of manufacture while I was choosing the toys. Um, but unfortunately, in these discount or dollar stores, they seem to be single sourced in, in some areas, and all the toys were from China. What tools were used to cut the toys? The tools that used, were used to cut the toys were ordinary scissors. That would cause a problem or potentially cause a problem if you're going to do metals analysis because you uh, stainless steel scissors could cause some of the stainless steel to enter into your toy sample, and we were aware of that. and we were, I have done studies where we have used other materials, ceramics and stuff, to cut our samples in order to reduce metal contamination. But for phthalates, we didn't believe it was a problem. Did all the ground polymers have the same temperature as the water? Yes. All the samples were at room temperature. They were all kept at, at room temperature. What was the BPA concentration difference between the polycarbonate and the other plastics? Um, at this point in time, we're not really going to get too much into the comparison of the other plastics. We were just looking at the PVC. We will get into some of the other plastics, the polycarbonates and uh, the PVC and some of the other plastics that we looked at during our second half, which is in June. Uh, is it possible to get a copy of the microwave method? Again, we are really going to go into a lot of detail about the microwave method optimization. We worked uh, quite a bit with CEM, who is the microwave manufacturer for our piece of equipment, and they've been very helpful in giving us methods and helping us optimize the methods, and, and they've basically given us their blessing to, to try to really uh, pin down different methods for the different phthalates and, and plastics. Did you sonicate the samples that had problems dissolving? Uh, we never actually had any problems with the samples dissolving. We had the samples had problems with the samples precipitating out of solution again, or trying to get them precipitated out enough that when you put them through a filter, you still didn't have a very hazy, uh, hazy sample. Uh, what column did you use in your GCMS analysis? Uh, the GCMS analysis is going to be something we definitely address during our second uh, part two of our, our program, our webinar. But I can tell you we used a, a routine uh, DB5 and RTX5 column. It wasn't anything special about the column. How large is the human error in the sample preparation aspect of preparing the samples? That is a very, very uh, wide open question. There, is, there could potentially be a lot of human error in sample preparation. Uh, it's something like the rubber duck, our, our friends and our fiends, the rubber duck, if you decide as a uh, researcher or a chemist to take the parts with, uh, that have paint and you're not going to, to 
grind the samples down to a powder, then you might have a higher result because that paint might have a, a different level of, phthal of phthalates in it. If you are not concerned with that and you decide to take all your samples from an unpainted portion, does that really uh, show a representative sample of, of that particular toy? So it could be, there could be a lot of human error. I think by grinding the sample, you actually do reduce the human error because you're taking the whole toy or at least the whole section of the toy and you're trying to make it as uniform as possible. What injection method on the GC? Uh, again, we're going to get into the GC parameters. It, it was just basically a straight injection. We didn't uh, do any thermal desorption or, or any other materials, although thermal desorption and, and some different other types of, of GC analysis have been suggested. I think we're... Yeah, I think that about wraps it up. Any additional questions that you may have can be sent to crmsales at specs.com. The email address is up on the slide right now. Uh, feel free to shoot us an email with any questions. So before everyone goes, I'd just like to announce a few new products. Uh, we're proud to announce a full line of one PPM ICPMS single element standards to go along with our already existing 1,000 PPM ICPMS line. Also available are two new trace metals in the natural wine matrix standards. The two standards are available in a red and also a white wine matrix. Uh, the part numbers are up on your screen. so. If you want additional information, uh, feel free to visit specsodaprep.com. I would like to thank Pat for giving a wonderful presentation. Have a great day.